Hello and welcome to Financial Markets Microstructure. This is lecture number 5. In the two uh, previous lectures, we have discussed the determinants of the spread. In particular, in the previous class, we saw that the spread is not only driven by adverse selection, which is the factor we explored two weeks ago, but rather order processing costs and inventory risk uh, are significant factors of the spread as well. However, as we saw, the dynamic effects of these three different mechanisms are different. Even though, if you look at a snapshot of market prices, you will not be unambiguously um, determine which of these three factors enter the spread. If you have a dynamic time series of data, you will be able to disentangle the three. In particular, we discussed that order costs only have short-run effects, which are immediately reversed by future trades. Inventory risk uh, generates medium-run effects, because dealers uh, accumulate their inventory, but they try to unwind it. They try to neutralize their position, but it might take them some time to do it. So the long-run effect of inventory risk should be zero, but in the um, medium run, it may always be present. And finally, adverse selection has a permanent effect on prices. So whenever some information about the fundamental value of the asset is revealed to the market, it is incorporated in all future prices. It may, of course, be cancelled out by a future piece of information that drives prices in the opposite direction. But uh, in principle, the effects are still permanent. Today, we have a two-part lecture. In part one, we will be looking at uh, determinants of market depth rather than market liquidity. In particular, the question we will ask is, how does trade size affect market prices rather than trade direction or the mere fact of a trade? And it will not be particularly novel because most of the factors will be the same as they were with liquidity. So in particular, we will look at a um, model that's very popular in financial markets microstructural literature. So along with gloston milger model, it is one of the founding um, models in the field that everyone should know and love. And this is a model by uh, Kyle, published in the same year as gloston milger model. And for our means and purposes, you should perceive this model as an extension of gloston milger model that allows for flexible trade sizes rather than always trading in the orders of size 1. This view is not perfect in that uh, Kyle model is not an extension of gloston milgram model, it's just a di different model, but for, um, for purposes of understanding the issues they raise and the answers they give, this perspective is good enough. In the second part of today's class, we will be talking about the empirical estimation of factors contributing to liquidity. So before we looked at how to estimate the spread, but without a, yeah, without a good theory for what drives it. This was lecture two, if you remember. Now we are armed with knowledge of what can influence the spread, what can generate the spread. And it is only natural to ask, how are these factors contributing to the spread in the real world? So how big is the contribution of every factor? And this is what we will do in the second part of the lecture. We will look at estimating price impact and depth, and uh, we will also look at estimating proportion of informed trading. So we will look at the contributions of uh, different factors to illiquidity and uh, these two related questions. So let us begin with our first question for today, namely determinants of market depth. And the question here is how does trade size affect prices? Now in the real world, the spread is generically larger for large trades. And um, the larger is the trade size, 
the further away the price moves from the efficient level. This is just a definition of limited market depth. And the question here is why? Why do traders have to pay more when they, have, when they want to trade large amounts? And let us begin with uh, the factors that we already know and see whether they can answer this question. If we look at adverse selection, the driving force that we explored there was that um, trades convey information about the actual fundamental value of the asset. And this information is inherently implemented into the prices at which the trades happen. In this way, if we uh, try to adopt adverse selection to this, to this fact, to this uh, limited depth aspect of the world, then the explanation would say that larger trades must indicate um, more news or stronger news about the asset value. So in Gloston Milgram model, a trader who wanted to buy conveyed a signal that the fundamental value of the asset is high, while the trader who wanted to sell conveyed the uh, news that fundamental value of the asset was likely low. Now, as we will see in the Kyle model, and as is very reasonable to just think about, once we enrich this simple model with the dimension of trade size, so we will allow the traders to choose how much they want to trade, it will be the case that the higher is the fundamental value of the asset, the more trader wants to buy and the less they want to sell. So adverse selection is quite an intuitive explanation of limited market depth. But do the other two factors extend similarly easily? In case of inventory risk, the answer is yes. So if you recall, the inventory risk uh, has arised from the fact that dealers do not like holding on to uh, non-neutral positions in the asset, long or short. And so the further they got away from the neutral position, the further they were driven away from this neutral position by trades, the more unfavorable prices they gave to the traders um, who wanted to drive them even further, and the more favorable prices they gave to traders who helped them revert to the neutral, neutral position. And so the stall model that we considered in the previous lecture has basically already given us uh, this mechanism of how inventory generates limited market depth rather than simply market illiquidity. In particular, large positions are risky for the dealer, so they incur larger uh, income risk, and they also take dealers longer to unwind, which is the effect that we did not explicitly consider, but once again, it sounds... Uh, like, it, like something that might be happening in reality. And these two factors lead to the fact that large positions require larger premiums from the traders to the dealers. So dealers require larger premiums to uh, trade large amounts. So both adverse selection and inventory risk are valid explanations of limited market depth. How about uh, order processing costs? and maybe anything else. So here I want to split the question into two. On the one hand, there are costs that traders pay to the dealers and there are costs that they pay to the exchange. So let us start with the first group, with the costs that traders pay to the dealers. And here I mean the actual allocation, not the nominal monetary flows. So meaning not traders pay to the dealers who then transmit the money to the exchange, but rather the money that ends up with the dealers. And as we very briefly touched upon, uh, some of this, some of these costs may arise from the fact that dealers are imperfectly competitive. So they have some market power, uh, 
and they can extract a little bit of surplus from the traders. So does this factor of illiquidity of non-negative spread, of non-zero, sorry, spread, also explain limited market depth? And the answer is maybe yes, maybe not. So market power does allow dealers to set wider spread, because this is what generates profits. But while it is true that the spread for any given trade size will be larger with imperfectly competitive dealers than it would have been with competitive dealers, with perfectly competitive dealers, that is, it is not clear whether this difference generated by imperfect competition would be larger or smaller for uh, large trade sizes. Meaning whether the pricing schedules that imperfectly competitive dealers set would be steeper or flatter than that set by perfectly competitive dealers. So this can go both ways. And the same actually ap applies to order processing costs. Meaning the here the costs that traders have to pay to the exchange, traders and the dealer, in this case. These costs, depending on what exactly they are, may increase or decrease in the per stock expression, in total order size. So in particular, if uh, traders have to pay to the exchange some fixed fee per order, which is something that actually happens in reality. Then this is a fixed cost per order. So the larger is your trade size, the less you have to pay per stock traded. But there might also be fees that are just proportional to the trade size. So if this trade fee is a fixed amount, say in dollars, per trade, then the uh, effect of order processing costs will be decreasing in trade size. But if these fees are counted as a, say, percentage of the trade amount, then they would naturally be constant in trade size. They would not depend on trade size. Finally, large trades may just have larger transaction costs which are not necessarily paid to the exchange, but uh, they are due to the fact that it might be more difficult to arrange or clear or settle uh, large trades because more guarantees, more insurance is required against counterparty risk. So this is one way in which order processing costs can increase in total order size. So we see that some of these factors and potentially all of the factors that we've seen before can explain limited market depth. Now let us look at one particular model, the Kyle model, and see how exactly adverse selection is uh, linked to market depth. So we will consider a very basic version in this, um, in this lecture, but if you have the textbook, or if you have rich enough fantasy, and um, strong analytical skills, then this model can be extended to accommodate perfect um, just a lot of different things, such as imperfect competition among dealers uh, and inventory risk, both of which are considered in the textbook. So with inventory risk, the Kyle model will be very, very similar to the Stoll model that we considered uh, last week. So we will definitely not be doing that. Okay, so what is Kyle model? Previously, meaning in Gloston Milgram model that we've seen two classes ago, adverse selection came from the fact that uh, the dealer or the market maker was uncertain whether the trader who submits the market order is a speculator, meaning they they are informed about the fundamental value of the asset. Or the trader is just some noise trader who trades due to their risk portfolio needs or due to liquidity concerns. 
And for tractability, we just assume that each trader was only present for one period and traded one unit of the asset. So we said one, uh, one justification that we gave for this assumption that only one unit is traded per period is that if somebody wants to trade a lot, they can split their trade into uh, many different trades, many small trades. So if I want to trade 100 stocks, then I can submit 100 orders for a single stock, right? And that would fit the and milgram model. But this is not a 100% good explanation. Because the, consider two different worlds. In the one world, there is just one trader, me, who wants to buy a lot, say 100 stocks, or say 100,000 stocks, if 100 is not a lot for you. So say, in one world, there's one trader, me, who wants to buy 100 stocks. In a different world, there are 100 small traders who want to buy one stock each. Is it immediate that these two events, that these two different worlds, um, tell us the same things about the fundamental value of the asset? For me, it is not immediate, because... 100 different traders can act upon the same information, possibly. And um, they might may have made these 100 purchasing decisions independently. But they all act upon the same weak signal about the asset value. While if I want to trade a lot, that is a very strong signal about the asset value. So I am willing to take a lot of risk and adopt this large position because I'm very confident about the fundamental value of the asset. So, this was not an innocuous assumption, this one unit per period uh, assumption. And therefore, we dispose of it. So, in this model, we allow traders to make order of any size, and everything basically comes from there. So, now dealers or market makers. Rather than submitting a single quote, a bid and an ask, so single quote for each direction of the trade, they will submit continuous supply curve. So for any trade of any size, they will quote a price. And one thing that I want to announce straight away is that this model will kind of resemble Stoll's model from last class. But both the issues explore and the analysis approaches are kind of different around these two models. So even the Kyle model with no adverse selection and inventory risk, like the one considered in the textbook, as I advertised you, will be analyzed quite differently from the Stalls model. It will be in a sense slightly more reasonable, but the assumptions involved and the analysis process are quite different across the two models. Okay, now let us set up the model in slightly more detail than I have been blabbering about so far. We have uh, the same three agents. On the one hand, we have a speculator, or the informed trader, who has private information about the asset. And uh, there is still only one speculator per period in the model, and this speculator decides how much to trade. So the speculator trades using a quote-unquote large speculative market order. Large here means relative to the total amount traded in the market during that period. And this speculator will strategically choose their order size to reduce price impact. Or to optimize price impact is probably the, be the better way to say it. So just like in Gloston Milgram model, the speculator will try to blend in with the noise traders who in this model will submit a random, an order of random size. We'll put a little more structure on that uh, very soon. But in the meanwhile, uh, we also have the dealers, or the market makers. And just as before, we will consider a single representative dealer slash market maker. And in this model, they are risk neutral and competitive. 
the fact that they are competitive implies that they will get zero profits and this is the fact that we will use. Now these uh, dealers they observe only aggregate market flow in a given period. But uh, just as before, they cannot distinguish speculative orders from noise orders. So they cannot tell whether, they cannot tell how, mu how much of the total order pool was submitted by noise traders and how much was from speculators. So in particular, the difference from Gloss Milgram is that here orders are cleared in batches rather than one by one. So we do not have a continuous auction, but rather we have a call auction in which the orders are accumulated over some period of time. So noise traders submit some orders and then the informed traders submit some more orders. And then once uh, the period length runs out, all of these orders are cleared at a single price. So we have uh, just one asset, same as before. It has some fundamental value V. And uh, now we impose some particular assumption V. In particular, we assume that V is distributed normally, so according to a normal distribution, with some mean mu and some variance sigma square V. The speculators, once again, observe the true value of V. So they have perfect information about the fundamental value of the asset. And given this knowledge of V, they place a market order X. So X here is the <coughs> order size. So given that, uh, given some price P at which the order will clear, the net profit of the speculator, the net gain, is given by this expression. So they buy x units, and the gain per unit is v minus p. Once again, we, we just assume that speculators uh, yield v from holding the asset, or from disposing the asset, uh, if x is negative. In particular, there are no explicit resale concerns modeled uh, here. Okay, the twist is that the price at which the trade will clear is not explicitly observed by the speculator when they choose their order price. Right, so if you think about the call auction, the informed traders just throw their order into that pool, but they do not know what will be the market clearing price once uh, submissions close and the trade and the trades are cleared. So in principle, in a more detailed model, the speculator would be able to maybe observe what uh, orders were submitted so far in the current trading period, and they have an idea of how many and what kind of orders will be submitted in the remainder of the period, but we are just abstracting from all that. So we are assuming that, say, every hour, Speculator and noise traders have to privately submit their orders and all of these orders will be cleared simultaneously. So the speculator does not know what other orders will there be in a given period. So the speculator does not know what exactly the price will be. Now the noise trader in this model has random demand given by U, which is also normal with mean zero and some variance sigma square U. Once again, we are not uh, saying that this random demand is completely, completely random, completely behavioral and arbitrary, that noise traders read the horoscope, but uh, we're just saying that reasons for which noise traders are trading are orthogonal to the fundamental value of the asset. So noise traders' orders do not convey any information about the fundamental value V. Okay, so the market maker, the dealer, submits a supply schedule uh, which is composed of combinations of Q and P. So here Q is the total uh, order size, the aggregate order flow, which is composed of X, the um, informed traders, 
order and u the noise traders order is also there so for every q the market makers uh, announce what is the price p at which this trade will be cleared the trade of this size and so the the market makers are competitive as I said, so they will get zero profit, so we'll just straight away assume that the price at which a given trade of size Q is cleared, at which the pool of trades of aggregate size Q is cleared, is just given by the expected uh, fundamental value of the asset, given this Q, given this order size. So on just a technical note, we are not just assuming that U and V are both normal, we are assuming that they are jointly normal and that they are also independent from one another. Okay, so just to reiterate everything once again, here is the timing of the model. At the beginning of the period, the speculator chooses how much to trade, X, the noise traders choose how much to trade, U, and the dealer submits the price schedule uh, P of Q. All of these three steps happen simultaneously. Once all this is done, the market price is determined, given the order size of informed and uninformed traders. So this is the total order size, and then the market price is pulled from uh, the price schedule that the dealer submitted. And then the trades happen, and so at the end of period, payoffs are realized. The trick that we will use in this model is that we will look for linear equilibria. In particular, we will look for equilibrium in which the speculator's strategy is linear in V. In particular, we will assume that their trade size X will be given by the difference V minus mu, so by how much the asset is currently undervalued or overvalued. And it will be scaled by some coefficient beta. So here beta is currently an unknown parameter that we will have to find in equilibrium. And this beta will be positive, because if you think of it intuitively, the speculator wants to buy the asset, so x positive, when the fundamental value v is greater than the current market valuation mu, so when the asset is currently undervalued, and vice versa, x uh, is negative, ideally for the speculator, when v is smaller than mu. So then the speculator wants to sell or go short. Here we will call beta the speculator's aggression by how aggressively they react uh, to news, how aggressively they trade based on the news. So large beta means that any information about V leads the speculator to trade a lot, to choose larger X in magnitude. So the market maker in the model knows the speculator's strategy in equilibrium, because in equilibrium everybody knows how everybody else is acting. So the market maker will know that the speculator uses a linear strategy with some coefficient beta. So the market maker will be able to extract this relation between Q and the asset value V. So once again, Q is current order flow composed of uh, order, orders of both informed and uninformed traders. And given that informed uh, order size x is a linear function of v, q will be just given by linear function of v plus some noise u. The problem that the market maker faces is to estimate v from q. So the market maker observed the total aggregate order flow q, but the market maker needs to infer what is the likely asset value v in order to set the price. So the market maker will want to set the market price uh, equal to the expected value of the asset given Q. And uh, 
as we will find, or as I will tell you and you will believe me, so we'll go in slightly more detail about this equation, but I'm stating it as is so far. This expectation will also be a linear function of q. So if q is 0, the expectation uh, will just be given by the exante expectation. No orders is kind of neutral news, because everything in our model is centered around 0. u has 0 mean, and v has uh, mean mu. So x has 0 mean. And uh, as uh, the total order size q grows, this expectation will uh, change linearly with it. I said intuitively here because uh, you can kind of maybe on a very surface level intuition guess that if q is linear in v, then the expectation of v will be linear in q. But this is not a 100% trivial fact. So the parameter of interest for us here is this coefficient lambda. So lambda will determine the market maker's strategy, and we will call this the price impact coefficient, because this is what this is, right? Lambda tells us how much the market price of the asset moves depending on the total aggregate flow, aggregate order flow. And we can actually estimate this lambda as the regression coefficient of q on v. Because if you look closely, this is exactly classic linear regression model with everything absolutely normal and nice. And this is in fact uh, how we will estimate lambda. But to remind you uh, the basics of econometrics, this regression coefficient is estimated as covariance between the two variables of interest, v and q, divided by the variance of our uh, regressor, q. And yeah, we've already discussed why the intercept here is mu. Okay, and uh, as I said, yes. Lambda here is the price impact coefficient, and you can see that this is the price impact equation. So the distance between the realized trade price and the ex ante market valuation is linear in the trade size with coefficient lambda. So lambda is the price impact coefficient, and inversely, 1 over lambda is the measure of market depth. Because market depth is kind of inverse to price impact. Market depth tells you how much you can trade before uh, price changes by, say, one dollar. Okay, now let us talk a little bit about this equation and how we can estimate V given Q. Now, we will not be talking in great detail about it, but I'll give you a gist of the idea. So the statement that I want to make is that in our version of the model, so when Q is given by this expression, and our two random variables, V and U, are jointly normal, then V conditional on Q is normal with this expectation, and uh, this variance. So let us look at this expression in greater detail. Uh, again, if you remember econometrics, it might look very familiar. If not, let us take a closer look. So what is the expectation of fundamental value v? given the order size q. Well, we've got to start from somewhere, right? And uh, the, base, the natural benchmark is the unconditional expectation of v. So we start from this unconditional expectation of v, and then we extract some extra information on top of that 
from the order size q, and this is our second term here. So what is the information that q conveys about v? Once again, one, when q is zero, this is kind of neutral information. And this is the expectation of q. This is the average value of q. So q minus expectation of q is the measure of information conveyed uh, by the trade size q. So if q is very much above its expectation, and this ex expectation is zero, then uh, this is a signal that v is very large. It might be the case that it's purely a fluke and that u was very large and v is actually small. But statistically speaking, it's more likely that it's uh, u to v being very large. Not very large part. If q is large, then it's more likely that v is positive than negative. So you can interpret that as some signal that v is positive and you can kind of uh, get an idea of how large v is. Okay, so this element is uh, the measure of information contained in q. And this fraction uh, normalizes the dimensions of the, of the problem. So it uh, takes us from the measure q and it maps this. It takes us from the scale of q's to a scale of v's. Here is another way to see this. I have rewritten this uh, original linear regression equation, normalizing all variables by their standard deviations. So standard deviation of a random variable is the square root of its variance. So we end up with this normalized conditional expectation of v on the left hand side. Uh, we once again start with the unconditional normalized expectation of v here. It should be immediate that you can take these square, uh, sorry, this, these standard deviations into the expectations. And then what you have here in terms of mu's contents of order size q is this normalized deviation of q uh, from its average is the dimensionless measure of the amount of news contained in q. And this fraction here is just the correlation coefficient, the correlation between v and q. So this may be the simpler way to interpret this coefficient to uh, interpret this equation. But let us go back to the slides. So if you are interested in seeing how you can obtain this result, not only find this expectation and this variance, but also just establishing the mere fact that v conditional on q is normal, then the slides have this uh, relatively extensive derivation. And it can proceed through the um, conditional PDFs. So just to outline briefly how it goes, uh, you can observe what the conditional distribution of Q conditional on V is, because you have this equation for Q given V. And it will obviously be normal, where all of this informed trade size is known and only u is random, so it will be normal with this mean and the variance equal to the variance of u. So you know this distribution of q conditional on v and you know the unconditional distribution of q, where both v and u are random. And going from there, you can pretty much basically apply the Bayes rule except with continuously distributed variables, you have to use PDFs, probability density functions, instead of probabilities. So here you have the conditional probability density of a given value of v conditional on q, which is what we want to find, which is the PDF that we want to derive. And it is given by the expression that is familiar to you from Bayes' rule. So the probability of a given value v times the probability of a given value q given v 
divided by the total probability of a given value q. In particular, these two f's in the numerator, vaguely written, are the probability, the joint probability of a given value q and given value v occurring simultaneously, right? So this is the probability of the joint event. In the denominator, we have the probability of q, which in the end gives you the probability of v conditional on q. Now, this probability of v conditional on q is something we want to derive. In this expression, all of these three PDFs are unknown to us. We know what the unconditional distribution of v is, we know what the unconditional distribution of q is, and we just saw what the unconditional distribution of sorry, what the conditional distribution of q conditional on v is. So all of these are normal, so you can plug in the normal PDFs with those means and variances that we just uh, found out, and you can just derive them uh, explicitly. What you will obtain is uh, given by this expression. So it will not be nice, but this is something you can do. You'll have some constant multiplying an exponent with something in the exponent. And what you will want to do with the exponent is you will want to reduce it to a full square. So basically at this point you either know how uh, the PDF of a normal distribution looks like, in which case it is relatively immediate what you need to do, or you do not, in which case you have an extra step of going to Wikipedia and looking up what the PDF of all normal distributions look like and what you should get here, what you, what you should obtain from here. So from, if you do all that, you will find out that this expression that you will obtain here it exactly describes the normal distribution and the mean and variance are just as we as have presented them two slides ago. So the mean will be this and the variance will be the inverse of this. Now if this was not clear enough and you're lazy to do it on your own, in one of the later exercise sessions, which is uh, exercise class 4 or 5, I cannot remember exactly, we will do this derivation very explicitly and there will be some mistake in there, a small one related to the missing multiplier. But the general argument you can get from there, so if you're very impatient you can skip to that uh, very very quickly right now. I will put a link in the description if I don't forget. Okay, so this was a small aside. A small, probably 15 minute long aside. The purpose of this was to claim that our market price, which is given by this conditional expectation of fundamental value v, given the total market size q, is given by this expression. And I guess we have not shown that explicitly, but if you compute the covariance and variances, and if you plug them into this expression, you will obtain the exactly same expression that we just had. So in particular, we have found our market, our pricing schedule, P of Q. And it is indeed linear. It is equal to mu plus some coefficient times Q. And our price impact coefficient, lambda, is given by this fraction. So it depends on the variances of our original random variables v and u. And it also depends on beta, on the trader's aggressiveness. Because this aggressiveness uh, basically tells you how much information is contained in any given trade. So, okay, we have found the pricing schedule given the speculator strategy. Now we need to find the optimal speculator strategy 
we need to show that it's linear, that it is indeed linear. And we need to find the speculator's aggressiveness beta. So the speculator knows that the pricing rule is given by uh, this linear pricing equation mu plus lambda q. And we can plug this into the expression for the speculator's profit, which was just x times d minus p. So if we plug in our p in here, we will obtain this expression in here, which is a quadratic expression in x with branches. So it will it is a downward facing parabola and it has a unique maximum and you can find it in many different ways in which you can find maximum of a parabola. And I will not even tell you what they are because you obviously know all of them. So if you maximize this quadratic function of x, for example through first order condition, you will obtain this first order condition from which you will obtain that x is given by exactly beta times v minus mu, where beta is given just by 1 over 2 lambdas. So this optimal trading strategy of the speculator is exactly as we conjectured it. In particular, we do not restrict the speculator to only linear strategies. Right? We are not saying that of all the linear strategies, beta is the best. We are saying that Given the linear pricing rule, linear trading strategy is actually optimal for the speculator. So it, is, it does not restrict the speculator to use linear strategy, but uh, he does it by choice. But our restriction to linear strategy comes uh, at a loss that we are only finding one equilibrium this linear equilibrium, while there may in principle be other equilibria with non-linear pricing rules and non-linear trading strategies. So these are equilibria that we will not be looking at for no particular reasons apart from the fact that they are just more complicated to compute. So if you know just a little bit of industrial organization, in particular you have seen a monopoly problem, then the speculator's problem here is very, well, not very, but at least somewhat resemblant to this monopoly problem. In particular, the speculator's problem is maximizing this profit, right? Trade size times the gain per share traded. But the trade-off is the larger is the trade size the lower is the gain per share. And so the speculator has to balance off these two forces. While in the monopoly problem, uh, the problem of the monopolist, say of a seller in the market, was to balance off the price of the product and the quantity sold to the market. And there it was also the case that the larger is the quantity sold, the smaller is the price. But the, of course, the feature in both of these problems is that lowering the price of the trade for larger quantities, or in this case, uh, raising, so, sorry, lower price per unit of the product in the monopoly problem and higher price per unit in this speculator's problem does not only impact the marginal unit traded, but it impacts all units traded. So if uh, I am a speculator and I'm deciding that whether to trade 100 units at a price of, whether to buy 100 units of the asset at a price of 10, or to buy 101 units of the asset at a price of 11, then this price increase from 10 to 11 does not only harm me on my 101st unit of the asset, but it increases the price at which, the, uh, which I have to pay for my original first 100 of units. So the marginal cost, the marginal expense 
of increase in my trade size uh, is well above the increase in the marginal price. I will stop here. Okay, um, the speculator here always expects a positive profit on average. So the speculator does not know what exactly is the profit that he will get because uh, he does not actually know what the price will be that he will trade at because this price depends once again on the order size submitted by the uninformed traders. But the idea here is that if the speculator could not could um, if the speculator was expecting a non-positive profit, so zero or negative, then this trading strategy that generates him that would be dominated by not trading at all, so submitting an order of size zero. So in the end, here the speculator here always gets a positive profit on average. I guess always and on average are somewhat mutually exclusive, but on average the speculator gets a positive profit. The competitive and risk neutral intermediaries, market makers, dealers, always earn zero profit due to the fact that they are competitive. But the surplus does not generate from nothing here, meaning that somebody must lose. And in this case, uh, the noise traders are the ones who lose, the ones who get negative profits in expectation. And this is the same as we had in Gloucester Milgram model. And the same as Q supplies. Uh, we are on the purely informational basis. Noise traders get an adverse uh, price movements for their trades. But this loss that they generate on their trades is likely to be offset by the gains that we do not model explicitly. So the improvements in risk portfolio by uh, fulfilling their liquidity needs and so on. So noise traders lose in our model, but this does not necessarily mean that noise traders actually really lose. It just means that uh, noise, the, the, we do not explicitly model the potential gains of trade for the noise traders, same as we do not explicitly model their reasons for trading. Okay, and at this point it is very trivial to close the model, right? We have solved two separate pieces of the model. In particular, we have derived the dealer's optimal pricing strategy given the speculator's uh, trading strategy, which gives us this equation. And we have solved the speculator's trading problem given the dealer's pricing strategy. And it gave us this equation. And here both lambda and beta were expressed in terms of each other. So at this point we can solve the model for both lambda and beta. Right? We should not have any unknown parameters left in our description of equilibrium. So we need to express this lambda and beta in terms of the known parameters of the model. And we can do this from this system of two equations, which will get us these two final equalities. So both traders aggressiveness beta and the price impact coefficient lambda in terms of uh, variances of V, the fundamental value of the asset, and U, the noise traders trade size. So in the end we have here that strategies are optimal given prices and prices are optimal given the strategies. So what we have here with these two coefficients is indeed an equilibrium in our model. Now, what does this equilibrium tell us? What can you tell about how this equilibrium looks like? If we look at beta, we see that the, this trade aggressiveness is higher when sigma v is small. So when the fundamental value of the asset is not very volatile, meaning that the profit per unit traded is not very large. In that case, when the profit per unit traded is not very large for the speculator, the speculator 
on the one hand needs to trade more to compensate for that. Uh, but on the other hand, it also means that that marginal expense, marginal loss of increasing trade size and uh, trading at more adverse prices is also lower because this marginal price increase will also be lower. On the other hand, the speculator will also be more aggressive when there is uh, when sigma u is larger, because in that case there is more noise uh, to hide behind. So the variance of the sorry the order size of the noise traders will be larger on average, and it will be more difficult for the for the dealer to extract information about v from the trade size q because it will be more random. Now market depth in our model is 1 over lambda and it's given by 2 sigma u over sigma v meaning that the market is deeper when there is less insider trading and more noise trading. And it's all pretty much for the same reason, right? When sigma v is small, speculator is more aggressive meaning that they trade more conditional on the same news about V and the price moves less given the same order size V. So the smaller is V, the less uncertainty there is. So the less news is there extract from um, from the trade size and also this news is uh, more thinly spread across trade size because the speculator is more aggressive. So the same trade size conveys weaker information about V when the speculator is more aggressive and this means that market is deeper just by definition of depth. And uh, of course more noise trading obviously leads to more market depth because then both noise traders and speculators trade more. And uh, once again the same trade size will be weaker news about V. Because given V the uh, both noise traders and the speculator will trade more when there is more noise trading when sigma u is larger. Now let us talk about some of the other things that we can compute in equilibrium. One thing we can compute now is the expected profit of the speculator, of our insider, the informed trader. In particular, if you plug everything we know about market prices, which will, which will be given by mu minus lambda q, but lambda x on average, and uh, we know the expression for x, the trade size of the informed trader. So once we plug in all of these into this expectation for the profit, we will obtain exactly this expression. We will see that the insider's profit will be increasing in both sigma v and sigma u. So it's obvious in sigma u. Once again, the more noise traders there are in the market, the more noise traders there are to hide behind, the harder because the harder it is for the dealer to extract information from trade size. And the more volatile is the value of the asset v, the more is the expected profit because then there is just well more discrepancy between the fundamental value v and the current market valuation mu for the insider to exploit. Another thing we can compute is the residual variance. So variance of v conditional on q and if anything we have already computed that when we were calculating this distribution of v conditional on q. I don't know why my highlights are funky here. But um, what does this variance mean? So why do we care about this? 
This residual variance measures the uncertainty that is remaining in the market regarding the fundamental value V given all the information contained uh, in the trade size Q. So the unconditional variance V tells us how much we do not know about V, about the true fundamental value of the asset. And this conditional variance tells us how much do we still not know after the trading has concluded. It obviously will be less than we did because Q uh, conveys some information about V, because speculators do convey some information in their orders about uh, V. And so we had this expression for this conditional variance. Uh, it had beta inside it, and now we know what beta is. So if we, if we plug it in here, we will get exactly this. We will see that the residual variance of V is equal to exactly one half of its initial variance. And you can say that we learn about one half uh, of information there is to know about V, and the other half remains unknown. It is completely neutralized by noise uh, in the random noise traders order size. And another way of saying this is that the insider, the speculator, reveals exactly half of his information. So this is the Kyle model, and to summarize it once again, it is a still it is a dealer model. So we have a centralized intermediary who uh, processes all the trades. It's just in this case, uh, the dealer processes trades not one by one, but rather in batches. But it is still true that our dealer is competitive and risk neutral. So. The dealer gets zero profit and they cannot um, extract any surplus from the traders. We still have an informed trader. Risk averse. I'm not sure why, why I put risk averse here, because our informed trader is not risk averse. Our informed trader is, in fact, also risk neutral. So let me scratch that. But our informed trader still observes a signal about asset value and places a market order. Uh, we have a call auction in this model. And the main insight that we can extract from this model is that market depth is partly due to insider trading. And uh, I should fix the slide. I, I'm not com comfortable with this formulation. So market depth is not decreasing. Market depth is limited due to inside, insider trading. And you can say that uh, the liquidity is decreasing in order size or uh, the spread is increasing in order size. But market depth is partly due to mar uh, insider trading who, while knowing exactly what uh, the fundamental value of the asset is, always ends up revealing to the rest of the market exactly half of his information. The advantages of this model are uh, should be pretty obvious, especially compared to the Lost and Milgram model. So it is more or less the same model, but it is richer. It allows us to explore the effects of trade size rather than just trade direction. And um, I guess one feature, again, I'm not sure if it's an advantage. It's been a while since I prepared these slides, okay? Uh, so trader, the speculator in Kyle's model, is not a price taker as he was in um, close to Milgram model. So here, the trader is still facing a fixed market schedule that has been predetermined by the dealer, but the trader can choose where exactly they want to be or not exactly, but where approximately they want to be on this price schedule. 
So now their trade size does affect the price that they will get. But on the downside, uh, of course, this model still ignores the resale and it has a bunch of features that do not apply to all markets. Right, so it's a batch auction, which is um, which means that the model does not necessarily apply to continuous auction markets. It is a dealer model, so it does not necessarily apply to order-driven markets with no central intermediary, and so on and so on. But this is a valuable model, and it is pretty extendable, or extensible, extendable. I will stick with extendable, meaning that you can uh, manipulate this model quite easily to enrich it in many different dimensions. For example, you can add dynamics, just as we had implicitly in the Gloucester Milgram model, where you had multiple trading rounds. You can have the same multiple trading rounds in Kyle's model. And here, if we assume that it is the same insider in every period, uh, while Noise traders to submit new random order in every period. Then we will get that the insider will reveal less than half of uh, his information in every period. And this will obviously be driven by the fact that um, this way they can exploit the, their information better. If they reveal less than half of the information, they get more favorable prices. But in fully dynamic model, they still have an opportunity to exploit this residual information further in the future periods. Uh, one example is um, continuous time model. And if you say that the time is uh, continuous on some interval from 0 to t, so we kind of have a call auction in every period, so they are infinitely frequently, you can see this as a limit approaching continuous auction. Then this residual variance will be linear in time. And by time t, the residual variance will be zero. So the insider in this continuous time model will try to spread his trades uniformly over the whole time interval that they have at their disposal. So, and you can see this as exactly a model of how to optimally split a large tra trade over time, except it does not really account for any other things that may change over time, like more news arriving, or noise traders changing their trade distribution due to different, uh, due to price changing over time, and so on. But you can see this is your first step on this path. Another extension we can have is uh, adding more insiders to the model. So in our model we had one large speculator, but in reality there are typically more than one such informed player. And the more insiders you have in the market, the more competitive they become with each other. So if you have more than one insiders, then um, each has a kind of a smaller market share and the impact of increasing the price a little further by increasing your own trade size are less. So your marginal loss from higher price is lower if you have more competition. This all leads insiders to be more aggressive when they have more insiders surrounding them in the same market. This will trivially lead to the market being more liquid overall and more information being revealed. So it's all, um, it's all nice and shiny if we can have more competition among the insiders. If you remember our discussion in the and Milgram model, we mentioned that liquidity and price discovery are often at terms with each other. So you can have one or the other. But here, if you can force the speculators to compete with each other, then you can have both. You can have both liquidity and price discovery. Obviously, the question is how do you get it? Because this is obviously harmful for the speculators. They would rather not compete with each other, but rather have market power. And 
there might be some kind of tacit or implicit collusion that they can arrive to in order to achieve that outcome. If you consider both of these extensions at the same time, so if you have dynamic model with several insiders, then you will have a rush to trade on this common information from the beginning. So everyone will try to preempt everyone else in order to trade early, while there is still a lot of informational advantage over the rest of the market that they can exploit. So in this case, this residual variance of V given Q will no longer be linear in time. The trading will no longer be uniformly spread over time interval, but instead it will be full, um, concentrated at the early time. Around market openings, if you like that. We can also consider alternative assumptions on the other side of the market, so not speculators, but rather the intermediaries. And we can look at a case in which dealers are not perfectly competitive as they were in our case, but rather have some imperfect competition. So if there are some finite number of market makers, and they are competing with each other Kurno style. So they each decide how much to supply at a given price. So this is more kind of a stalled model reasoning, although these um, dealers will still not be perfectly competitive with each other. Right, in this case, um, well, again, this will be kind of similar to Kurno competition in industrial organization if you've seen it. So all the insights will be the same. The markets will be, in this case, less liquid because we are comparing with perfect competition rather than a monopoly. Prices will no longer be efficient, but the insight is that prices will still be linear and this price impact coefficient lambda will be given by this uh, expression, which is larger than in the perfectly competitive case. And this is obviously due to imperfect competition. This will be driven by the market power. So here dealers will uh, get some profit on top of the fair price, the fair market valuation given the trade size. And you can see that in this particular model, so in Kyle model with imperfect competition, uh, the market power for the dealers will be a contributor to limited market depth. While if you remember, as we said at the beginning of this lecture, it is not clear that uh, which direction this imperfect competition could drive uh, market depth. So in this case, it decreases market depth, but uh, in some other cases, in some other models, it could in principle maybe improve market depth. Finally, one extension that uh, we have mentioned quite a few times is risk averse market makers, which will enable inventory concerns, inventory risk, and uh, will get us a model that considers both adverse selection and inventory costs. As I also said many times, it will be quite similar to the stall model that we had last in the last class. And for simplicity, we can even assume no inf asymmetric information there. And we can allow for imperfect competition there. So you can you have a lot of these different sets of assumptions, and you can mix and match them in any time, in any way you want. So you, with risk aversion, the model will be, will give you pretty much the same conclusion that we, you had in the stall model. But now you can also explicitly consider imperfect competition, so maybe Kyle model is more advanced than stall model. It strictly supersedes the stall model. So this concludes our discussion of part one, of determinants of market depth from the theoretical point of view. In part two of this class, we will look at empirics of illiquidity and market depth. So stay tuned. <laughs>